not doing that. Um, I want to. I, I do want to focus though. Like I teach probably more about escaping different positions than anything else that I teach. Uh, mostly out of necessity. Like I've got one of the most the things I've spent the most time in my jiu-jitsu career on is like bottom side control, survival and escape, and even attacks. Uh, completely out of necessity because I lived there for most of my life. So in, in like present day included for a, a, to a big extent. Um, and I'm also kind of lazy. So it's kind of accessible for everybody. If you're, if you have like athleticism and stuff, then you know, it's going to be even easier to, to do some of these escapes. Um, something we faltered in that I realized is that Patches did a good job introducing himself and the rest of us did. <laughs> like David just jumped right into it and Mike jumped right yeah, into yeah. it. So I'm going to bring it back full circle and I'm going to like talk about myself real quick. Uh, my name's Eli Knight, if you didn't know either. Um, I do jujitsu that mostly just works on YouTube. I've been doing jujitsu for a very long time. Um, it, it made me think because I was thinking about Patches talking about when he got into jujitsu. Like he, he saw the UFC and that made him want to like do jujitsu. I was already doing it, uh, but uh, like Japanese jujitsu, so not really the same thing at all. But it was cool to see uh, jujitsu like triumph over these different arts. But I, I, we we made note the guys I was training with, and I made note that like this is different than the jujitsu we were doing. And the coolest thing to us about it was obviously the efficiency of it, the, te the technique aspect of it, the um, but the formula of it was really cool because like there was there was this formulaic approach almost like Hoist would go out, and that's my teacher by the way. I'm under Hoist Gracie, but uh, he would go out and just kind of systematically the same thing. It's like manage the distance, close the distance, get into the clinch, get the fight to the ground, establish some kind of dominant position, and then choke the guy or arm lock the guy or whatever. And it was just old, repeated over and over. And then we started going back and watching these old, uh, like the old Gracie's in action tapes on like VHS and stuff. And again, I learned what that is later. But the, yeah, exactly. So we, we, would, um, we would see kind of the same thing happen over and over again. So it was really interesting to see that. Um, then on the, the back end of it is to, to see the escapes and to see how uh, interesting it was to deconstruct all the elements of the offense to come up with the back end escapes and defense elements. And I think that that's one of the most important things. That's where my head has been for several years now. It's like the escapes are interesting, techniques are interesting, but techniques are not. The technique is a technique is a technique. And so you have to be spoon fed these things for a while, but eventually you should just kind of forget techniques. Ryan always gives me shit about my analogies, but I think this one is spot on. It's, uh, it's like soap, and this is the one they always make fun of me for. But it is, if you think about it, like you use the soap, you get the bar soap, you lather up with it, right? But that's not his job, right? The job isn't done until you rinse it away, and the soap's gone. Then it's done its job after it, you can't see it anymore, right? And that's, I think, how jujitsu should be. You, you get these things, you experiment, you experiment with these things, and you experience how effective these techniques are. And then through that experience, like what is really happening, the techniques are the delivery uh, vehicle for the principle. And you can't principle your way into principle, right? You, that's just philosophy. That's why I always like talk shit about Aikido and Tai Chi. It's like, they're just philosophies. They're martial arts philosophies, that, and they're great, they're beautiful, but there's no, there's no teeth to them. You can't get to Aikido through Aikido. You can't get through, to Tai Chi through Tai Chi. You get to Aikido, through Jiu Jitsu. And the, the main thing I mean by that is like there has to there's there has to be friction. There has to be work done. You can't seamlessly flow into to energy. You can't redirect energy seamlessly. Um, so having said all that, um, I want to make mention um, because it, it hasn't really been illustrated so for I don't know exactly everybody's level of training, but I think it's worth reiterating you know, even if you have an extensive amount of training about the positional hierarchy and why that exists. And it's not the end all be all, but I think it's a good rubric because it boils things down to four basic positions, right? And that's helpful whenever you're trying to identify what the hell's happening to me right now. Where am I? I feel like I'm in a blender. There's, I can't even figure out what's going on. What is the closest adjacent position that you recognize, right? Is it mount, side control, guard, back control? It's gotta be one of those, right? Or some variation thereof. And there's lots of permutations of guard, of, of different types of mount. We talked about technical mount, we talked about knee on belly, we talked about side control variations, north, south, all these things. But really you can kind of boil them down mostly into one of those four elements. So if you get yourself into a position 
and you don't really understand the position, find something adjacent that you do understand. I think that's one of the best pieces of advice that I could offer. It's helped me a lot, even if you feel like you're backtracking. Because the same way that you would play a chess game. It's like, okay, I'm losing position here, right? Well, I'm gonna have to retreat a piece. And that sucks because like I'm failing, I'm, I'm moving backward, right? But at least I'm moving back to a position where I know what the hell's going on. I can operate there. I can't operate from somewhere I have no idea where I'm at, right? The GPS doesn't work. So I'm like trying to figure it out and dismantle it and I've gotta have some platform. So then once you start to see different variations and how they work and everything and how the energies operate in those places, then you don't really need to be spoon-fed answers all the time anymore. You can start coming up with your own things. Right? And so that's where uh, a lot of the work that I've done in, in it's such an overused cliche term these days, but systematizing or systematically approaching whatever, creating a system for a position, that's, that's been my mindset that's been the most beneficial to me whenever it's, it's dealing with escaping now, when we talk about bad positions, and not, not just bottom pins necessarily, bottom typically is where we think of when we're in a bad position, but you could technically be in somebody's guard or have somebody on your back and it doesn't necessarily look like a bottom position. So you know we can address those things too. And if you guys have any questions along the way of something that is even tangentially related, I'll be happy to address it. If you, if you have like a position where you're like, I just get screwed here constantly. Like I, I have no idea, every time somebody gets me here and I get here a lot, I just get like trashed every time I'm in if you have anything like that, I'm happy to address it. But the place that I want to start out though, <clears throat> I want to think about if I am bottom, and we'll start from like, uh, uh, Jeff, I guess since you're the, the ookie all weekend man, might as well keep you tuned. Um, first thing I want to start talking about is like if, if we're here this way, he's standing, I'm seated, right? Now if this is, again, if this is more uh, sport, then I'm going to be in this kind of patty cake position, right? Horrible idea for the most part if this is self-defense or this is MMA because like he can reach me with all of his limbs and my head is pretty exposed. I'm gonna have to do this and that's not gonna be beneficial to me at all. So it's better, if, depending on what the distance is and how I gauge that, if I start from more of a supinated position like this. When I'm in the supine position, things that I want him to see, regardless if this is sport or self-defense, is uh, he wants to see the opposite of what I wanna show him. What I wanna show him is I want him to see the bottom of my feet. I want him to see retracted knees that create approximately a V shape, right? I want my arms drawn in like this here, and I want you know something like a 90 or less degree bend in my legs. So what does that mean he wants to see? Well, back up just a little bit. He wants to see the tops of my feet where my shoelaces would be, because that means he can like grab those better and, and move those around better. He wants to see an L shape of my legs, because that's his passing opportunity in a lot of different ways when we start looking at guard passing, right? And he wants my legs to be overextended because from here my core is disengaged and it's easier for him to manipulate my legs, right? So again, we're just reverse engineering what I wanna show him versus what he wants to see. Now, if I do need to get myself back to a vertical position, then there's ways that I can accomplish that. I can do it independent of connection to him, right? But I still need, for that to happen, I need to create space. So the way I'm gonna create space, the easiest way is to use my feet as space makers. So as he's uh, approaching, if he's leaning over, I can kick up and everything like that. I can kick him in the balls, it's fine. I can kick at knees, which tends to be fairly effective because he's gonna be presenting one or both knees. If both knees are presented to me, I can stomp either leg that I wanna stomp here. If he's bladed, right, I probably wanna double my efforts on one leg here. And I'm not over committing like this. I'm stomping or trapped, stomping or trapped here just to create a little bit of space. I don't have to buckle his leg. If I break his leg, that's fantastic. It's not gonna happen though. Now I'm gonna post up on my elbow first and retract my hip and then eventually get to here. Every time that I'm, I'm creating verticality, that's a word, then I'm also creating space and distance between us, right? So as I'm coming up though, I want to have some kind of like reinforced protection in case he closes that distance faster than I expected him to here, right? So I'm either covering my head or even framing here. Both have pros and cons to them, I prefer this. Um, <clears throat> if he closes the distance just absolutely too fast, then it's okay for me to retreat back to here. Again, uh, I'm going back to a place that I can operate from. So again, I've posted up here now, right? And again, I'm gonna go back and repeat that process. I'm gonna throw a kick from here. I think that one of the better kicks to throw from this position personally is um, this lifting kind of more of a pendulum style kick because I can load my hip up and create that pendulum kind of effort behind it, and it's more thrusting. Nothing wrong with these necessarily, sorry, these necessarily, these inside kicks, but this is pretty weak, right? It's just like a hip that's doing that. It's not 
the full thrust of that pendulum action, right? So now I'm kicking to here and off the retraction, not only am I retracting this leg all the way back to create a pyramid structure that still have the base, but I'm sliding this leg back at the same time. When I come up, I get this kind of three-point stance like this. What this does for me is like it creates a good structure that if he crashes the distance, I can withstand a tackle or withstand him like crashing in on me. Um, but also, if I, when we get up, if I want to re-engage, I can shoot and swing off that back leg, right? So we have both of those things that we can accomplish with that. So, Cliff's Notes version. As we're here, whatever's presented to me, that's what I'm gonna stomp. Again, bottom of my feet are facing him, my knees are retracted, my arms are drawn in. I'm gonna kick and stomp whatever I can to create space, post on the elbow, retract the hip, get to the hand, here. Covering the head, here, again, kick, whatever's available, I like that pendulum kick, and then slide as we come up. Create this three-point structure, we're gonna talk about this pyramid structure a lot today, so this is one of the first times it's really being introduced. And then as we come up, hands are immediately up so that we're back into the fight from a standing vertical position. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Too much, too little? Good. All right. Uh, let's go. One, two, three. Um, and you're not probably going to get enough reps in a seminar to become proficient at anything anyway. So just enough reps to get you like, to understand the mechanics and then take it and train whatever you want to train. So um, having said that, the thing that I have to account for, I'm looking at... This in terms of, we're looking at this in terms of like, so I'm here, right? I make space, I start to get up. So on this retraction that I'm doing, on this retraction that I'm doing, there's, uh, there's a relationship between this and shrimping. Does everybody know what shrimping is when we <laughs> talk about that? You know what shrimping is, right? So, um, but the thing that people don't look at, I think, is that there's two, two movements on the ground from bottom position that are more powerful than any other movements. It's bridging and shrimping. And there's variations of those two things. Shri uh, bridging is arguably the most powerful move you can make, period. And if you don't believe me, like, see how much you can bench press like compared to hip thrust, right? So this is a powerful position. When you're underneath somebody, it's gonna be one of your biggest space makers. Mike touched on this a lot when he was talking about positioning for top of the mount, because you have to take that in consideration. When you're mounted on top of somebody, if you're not really aware of it and you're not like uh, apt to change your position, you're essentially putting your foundation, your center of mass, directly over the most like powerful explosive part of their body, right? So the bridging is an extremely powerful movement, but also shrimping is a very powerful movement too. And it's this retraction kind of thing that's happening. So the relationship that I wanna point out though is that um, from here, shrimping looks like this, right? So there's this shoulder hip relationship. I'm pivoting from my shoulder, retracting my hip. If I go to my elbow, right? Elbow, if we go down the chain, equals knee, right? That's gonna be the most like anatomically efficient kind of way to move. When I'm at my hand, hand equals foot, right? Shoulder, hip, elbow, knee, hand, foot. Head, shoulders, knees, toes. So when we get here, that's, that standing, that technical stand-up that we always do, it's just like a grown-up shrimp. It's like a jumbo shrimp, right? It's not like a cocktail or a salad shrimp. So when we get here, that's the idea. As I'm moving back here, boom, I scrape here like this, either back to my hip or my knee. I would say stay to your hip until I can go to my hand because there, now, I'm gonna go here. So in other words, I don't wanna, I don't wanna post on my elbow and try to get myself to standing. It's gonna be very awkward for most people. Not for Mike, because he's got this weird monkey flexibility, but for no, more normal humans, it's gonna be awkward. So we wanna move like anatomically as efficient as possible. So the problem exists though, whenever I, I'm trying to make that space and he collapses the space faster than I can create it functionally, right? Um, so what does that look like? So if Cash is approaching and he gets me too bunched up here like this, now, uh, he may be giving me different targets or whatever, but like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to like really uh, effectively target his knees or anything. So I have to think about things in a little different terms. But when he gets this close, he gives me new uh, potentially new kinds of things that I can do. So one of the things, and oftentimes the, the guy's approach, he's gonna be bladed to some extent. One foot's gonna be more in front of the other. So I'm gonna take inventory of that and start looking for a sweep. I think that sweeping from this position is probably a much more beneficial way to get yourself back to standing because he's going down and I'm coming up versus he's already up 
and I'm trying to come up too, right? So when we get to this position here now, once he's this close, again, my knees were retracted, so even if he is trying to get a hold of my feet or whatever, he's still gonna have a difficult time uh, making, accomplishing a lot with it. So I, I wanna try to get a hold of whichever leg is closest. And if neither one are close, we'll talk about that in a minute too, but I wanna get a hold of whichever one is close. This arm is still a defensive measure. It's still an obstacle in our way in case he wants to reach me, hit me, anything like that, right? From there, on the same side that I'm grabbing the ankle, I'm gonna place my foot laces out, heel in like this, because it matches the shape of his hip press here. Now, I've got all the leverage I need to be able to sweep him. The problem is gonna be though, if I push and pull, he's just gonna pivot on that leg here. He's gonna set a kickstand back there. So I wanna prevent that from happening, so I'm gonna use my second leg to hook behind this one. There's pros and cons to going too high or too low. I like to go somewhere around the calf personally. I think that that's a, a good spot. Um, but if you go behind the knee, it's not the end of the world. You just might get your toes a little crushed in training. Uh, so when we're here, I'm holding the ankle. I'm specifically using a five finger over grip like this. We'll talk about the difference in the C clamp grip versus this monkey kind of grip later. But my forearm is on top of his foot. My heel is in, so my foot's on his hip, and this one's hooking back. I'm gonna push with the leg, pull to some extent on this foot, and pull to some extent, mostly just block with this second foot. As he falls, most normal humans are gonna fall this way because I stretched this leg on the sweep, right? Now, knowing that, again, I'm posted here, elbow, so pop quiz. What does elbow equal? Yeah. I was asking her. Damn, guys. Wait. Good enough, though. good enough. Okay, so knee here, right? <laughs> now, if we race to see who gets up fastest, right? Someone you tell you, say one, two, three, go, and we're gonna see who gets up fastest. One, two, three, go. I'm gonna win every time, right? Because I cheated. <laughs> if there's one extremely important thing that gets overlooked, is the necessity and desire to cheat anytime you can. Always cheat, right? First, even before that, is be the bigger, stronger, faster person. That's number one. Always fight smaller people and then cheat, right? So um, the techniques are where we cheat. Like that's, that's kind of cheat, right? So no fair fights. So again, here, here, I've got these two attachments. I'm blocking his foot here. I'm hooking back here. I push, pull, boom, this way. As I come up, I'm still combing my hair back though because either intentionally or accidentally, this leg might come into the equation and I don't want to get knocked out, right? So now I retract that leg to the knee. I pick the foot up here so it's in front of my face. And as I come to standing here, I'm gonna be a little nitpicky about how we pass this because I don't like to ever cross my center line if I can help it, right? It's usually a bad idea in fighting, every modality of fighting. So instead, I'm at center line. I'm gonna scoop and pass. So I step to the outside, right? Now I've won this space. If I do this, I haven't won a whole lot. He's got all of his weapons in my way. But if I scoop to the outside, now it's a little harder for him to get his legs back in front of me before I can establish like a knee on belly or slide over the mount or just disengage and get the hell out, right? So that's kind of the mentality of whenever I get to that standing position, I wanna scoop and step, not step, lunge. There's a difference. Uh, and for terminology sakes, that matters sometimes. A lunge is where you take the leg that's in front and move more in front. A step is where you take the leg that's in back and put it in front of the one that's in front, right? Okay, that seems like, well, yeah, no shit. But for terminology sakes, it's kind of important, all right? Anybody need to see the sweep again? Good, let's try it, guys. One, two, three. Not because uh, I do. I don't have to have a reason to like it. So when we get here, um, if, let's show you a defense on his part, which, I still stand by the idea that it's, it's not a good pedagogical approach to show a move and the counter to the move and the counter to the counter all in one setting. What does that word mean? Pedagogical is a teaching, it's like pertaining to teaching methodology. So like, it's not a good approach from a teaching perspective to show um, something and then the contrary thing to it and then contrary to that. Because what tends to happen, <coughs> tangent. Uh, what tends to happen is that you start to diminish your faith in that first thing. It's like, oh, well, this is easily counterable. And then the counter is easily counterable to that. So now it's like, well, now all of a sudden these first two things, especially the first one, doesn't mean as much to you because you just saw like, oh, well, it's easily defeated, right? Well, 
everything has a counter to it. And if you really go by the idea that I, I mentioned first uh, and foremost about reverse engineering or deconstructing the move to come up with the counter for certain things, you can sometimes gain a deeper appreciation and understanding of the position or the technique by looking at the counter to it because you're immediately seeing the reverse engineered process behind it, right? So this is why I violate that thing and contradict myself sometimes. All right, so contradiction number one, we get here. This is a great sweep. This sweep works at all levels. Like I sweep white belts with this sweep to this day. Um, they're not as often, it's like white belts obviously, but it still works. If he wants to counter this, one of the best counters that he can do when I'm this deep into it is for him to do an outside crescent kick, right? So he kicks forward and unhooks his foot and steps back, right? Now, if he just tries to pull his foot directly back, he's just gonna trip himself and make my sweep easier. So he has to unhook it this way, that way here, okay? We call it the fish hook principle, and I'll discuss that in more detail sometime. We go here like this. So if he does that, boom, here, I'd be like, hey, can I have your leg back so I can sweep you? And he might give it, you know? Probably not. So he says that, I still have this connection though. So I'm gonna use that connection to pull myself to that side, like I'm trying to pull my head toward his leg. And now I reestablish connection with this hand, shift the foot up to the hip. And then if I need to scoot forward, I can reestablish here. So now we're doing the same thing just on the other side. So now we can turn it into a drill where if I, as I start to push pull, he crescent kicks out, boom. And I reestablish, right? Now I get this, I push pull, he reestablish, yep, boom, he kick out, boom, here. So we just keep moving like this. And so now I'm, I'm constantly looking to reestablish that connection. And I'm not too crestfallen whenever he kicks out, right? Because that's what happens a lot of the time whenever you're going for a movement and they shut you down, right? And there's two, there's two moments more than any other, I feel like, where you're disconnected from the present and you're gonna be more susceptible to being caught with the next move. And that's in moments of uh, disappointment in yourself or in moments of like, um, like celebration, right? Both of those are bad, one more than the other, right? But it, both are thinking about something that happened previously or is gonna happen later. Do not concentrate on the present moment. The best thing that you can do, and not to get too like philosophical or anything, but is to be committed to the focus. Okay, this bad thing happened, so what? Next thing, right? Doesn't matter. Feel sorry for yourself later, right? Be happy about something you did later. Celebrate later, right? Don't do it right now, because you're gonna disconnect and that guy's gonna be able to pick you apart because you're creating a lapse in time, right? A lapse in space. Anyway, let's come back. So. You learn to seamlessly transition between sweep to sweep. He kicks out, again, crescent kick. I pull myself to the side, reestablish, scoot forward, rehook back here. He kicks out again, boom, boom. Right. If you wanna put punctuation on the end of this, just finish the sweep. I do five of him stepping out and then six sweep, right? Now I stand up, right? I go here, boom, I sweep, I stand, I get to this position, I scoot to the side, I back up, give him space, now what's he gonna do? Right? Yeah, exactly. So I kick out, boom, here, he reestablishes. I kick out, boom, he reestablishes. I kick out, right? Now, after five or six of those, he sweeps me, and we repeat the process. So let's do that like three, four thousand times, and then we'll move on to the next thing. Ready? One, two, three. Anything that I say is, it doesn't come across as just like arbitrary in, in the reasoning behind it. Uh, okay. When we get here, he's down. The reason that I say all these things about he wants me to see the bottom of his feet, like when you woke up here, he wants me to see the V shape, he doesn't want me to see the L shape, all that. If you think most about most of the guard passes that I'll do from here, equate to making his legs go into an L shape. If I go knee cut pass, there's the L, right? If I go leg drag, L, right? If I go Toriano, L, right? So don't take the L. So my, yeah. Like that's, uh, so that's, that's the thing though. So if he keeps this V shape, and this is something that like, I, I'm almost completely regurgitating this from uh, Hoffa Mendez, and that he pointed these things out. And I was like, God, man, that, that, that was worth the price of, the, like we were talking about that moment of like, that was worth the price of admission. That's, that was what I took from his, his uh, guard passing and guard pass prevention seminar. And I'm like, that, that goes across the board. Like whether this is self-defense, he, he was obviously teaching a very sporty e jujitsu seminar, 
But I'm like, those principles he pointed out right there, I'm like, that changed my entire guard pass prevention uh, game and guard retention game. I, I, I tend to chop things up when we're playing guard from guard play where he's on the offense, guard retention where his guard is being threatened and pass prevention where it's later stage and I'm already starting to mount some kind of defensive strategy or, or passing strategy and he's having to defend in the later stages. So those three elements are all reinforced by this structure here. Now, that's not to say that you're just gonna hang out here and be okay, because you have to mount some kind of offense, you have to create some kind of space to get yourself back to standing, or you have to get me down on the ground, or both, right? So the sweeping that we're working on right now is good for those reasons. Now, let's say that, I'm, so I'm, I'm going backwards. We could approach this from down in the closed guard to standing, or we can do like we're doing right now, where we go long distance, uh, grounded versus standing into close guard. Because as I get closer to him, if his things have failed, he failed out here keeping me away and making space. I got closer, now he's failing about keeping, keeping me away. My hips are getting in past the line of his ankles, right? When we're passing the guard, you can think about it in basically three segments. You can pass the line of the ankles, the line of the knees, and essentially, eventually the line of the hips. Usually that's gonna kind of be the formula for guard passing. So if I'm here and I'm starting to crouch him up, well now him getting into the hips and stuff to be able to sweep me that uh, with that previous sweep is not gonna be the thing, right? It's not gonna work. But in doing this, I've given him closer access to grab both my two ankles here, you see. And now, and, and hopefully now, this idea of the forearm going across the tops of the feet here, now it makes sense, right? Because I know if I wanna kick out of this, I've got to step out through the inside. I can't step back. And I can't just directly pull up now, and I can't even kick forward because he's doing a good job. I have to like really find that space. But when he grabs these two uh, connections here, and he starts putting his knees together, and then he's gonna start driving his uh, heels down and lifting his hips up, and now from there, he's gonna make the sweep, right? So this is a, even a closer range sweep that we're talking about because he's closed that space. I was late, right? But just because I'm late, uh, the, the, you need to try to eliminate the idea of too late, right? This is where, that, this is not the best segue, but it's, it's gonna work. Um, here's the problem. I like to say this anytime I'm around jujitsu people or Krav people or hopefully both. Here's the problem with both those martial arts. <laughs> At the extremes, Krav Maga is too much preemption. It's too much, well, don't let it get there, right? Just don't, don't let the fight go to the ground. Just end it standing. Just do this, just do that, right? It's like, okay, cool, but like, if you could dictate every aspect and every range of the fight to that extent, you shouldn't be in the fight in the first place, right? You're in the fight because shit went sideways right off the bat, right? So um, on the jiu-jitsu side, the jiu-jitsu corollary to it, it's like, well, we're gonna go so late stage, and if I can get good in these late, late, deep stage, deep waters here, then the rest of it will be easy. And it can be a false correlation there too. Right? Obviously the answer is somewhere in the middle and you need to see everything from preemption, right? Extreme preemption to extreme late stage deep water activity, right? So, um, what are we talking about? Double ankle sweep now. We looked at the tripod sweep um, and now we're looking at double ankle sweep. So, so he, cra he crashed me up a little bit like this. And this could also happen just as easily if he, he were down in my closed guard at some point and he stood up right and now he's here but i have access to grab both his two ankles i'm folding my elbows in i'm bringing my knees together and i'm driving them up toward his diaphragm and i'm lifting my hips right my feet my toes are kind of curling in toward his spine my heels are kind of biting down toward the ground toward his butt these knees are going up here this way now from here i'm not going to retract because i'm already past the line of his knees essentially so that means uh kind of from a formulaic perspective it's a little better for me to go push forward, right? I'm deep enough that I need to push the, all the rest of the way in. So, um, that's so cheap, no? Okay, so when we're here, I'm gonna make this S curve with my legs, like this, and I'm gonna start driving hips forward. I'm gonna try to punch them in the chest with my hips. So I go here. Knee goes to the floor, this way. And I'm gonna hop on this hand until I can reach the back of his head if it's available, right? If it's not available, well, maybe he has clothes on, hopefully. If he doesn't have clothes on, reevaluate your, your life decisions and who you're fighting. 
but like I can grab onto material and grab hair, grab whatever to help pull me into the mount. Now I keep hopping around, circle, circle, and now I'm back in that mounted position and we're gonna apply all the details that Mike told us in the last section, right? And patches on the first day as well. So, uh, one more time on this double ankle sweep. And practice it from both. Practice from he's already standing and crouching me in, or he starts in my closed guard from here. If you're gonna start from here though, I, I recommend doing this. Keep his head pulled down in a high guard. Because if he wants to stand now, look at how close he has to bring his feet. Keep going. Stand all the way. Go, 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 go. He has to bring his feet this close. If I'm not doing, doing good head pressure, head control, he can step up with his feet farther back and I won't be able to reach them. So um, I would prefer him to step these two close so I can grab both. Knees come in, hips lift. Oh, here, right? A lot of the time I'll get to pick. Sometimes he has to pick for me, sometimes I'll get to pick which side I'm gonna go on. Either way, I'm S-curving my legs, right? I'm posting up on my hand and I'm driving hips forward this way, right? As soon as I can, I'm gonna grab the back of his head. That means this hand is hopping around and I'm circling, pivoting on this knee, get myself all the way to this mounted position, okay? From there, I can step back, it's his turn, right? If he doesn't hold my head and I go to stand up, I may do this, right? This kind of stuff. If he's holding my head down, yeah. And by the time he lets go, there's a little kind of this like spring-loaded jack-in-the-box action. And so then I create a lot of momentum that's gonna help him sweep me, right? So all good things. Uh, so double ankle sweep, let's try this a few times, guys. Watch your space so you're not dumping your partner on somebody else. One, two, three. Usually if you're rushing more than anything else, as you start to come up, I make the sweep into my invisible partner here. As I come up, if I go here and I make my S curve, right? It's not really an S, it's more like a, it's more like a half of a swastika, really, if you think about it. Whoa. And I, people always react when I say it, but it's literally, I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm saying like, this, why, yeah, but you should, if I had, do what? Did you say it was made fun of your analogy? I know, yeah, well, they're problematic. That one for sure. I can't post online. Yeah, <laughs> uh, not right now, wait, wait a couple years. So um, when we get here, if I leave this leg sticking out as I start to try to come forward, this kind of stuff happens, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying like, take your time. Once you make that sweep and you start to come forward, suck that foot back a little bit. And that's why we post out here. So now that doesn't require flexibility anymore. Not really extreme flexibility anyway. Versus if I leave this out here and I start trying to push, now I'm doing this matrix kind of thing here and it's not gonna work out for me. And I'm gonna at best create a big pocket of space that they're gonna slip out of or I'm not gonna have the balance to establish them out. So take the extra fraction of a second to suck that foot back a little bit and circle around rather than coming too straight forward in that trajectory, right? Now, <clears throat> so what's the, I don't know if this would be a progression, I guess it'd be like a regression because we're going like worse and worse and worse, right? At first, I just got back to standing, okay, cool. Then I had to kind of kick him away, get back to standing, then I had to sweep him, then I had to sweep him from closer distance. Uh, and so now, you know, it's even closer so what's closer than that? Either in my guard or in the mount. And um, I, this is where I always feel like it's a choose your own adventure. Right? So when we look at sweeps from the guard, okay, we turn to page 59, sweeps from the guard. If you want to instead look at escaping mount, you turn to page like 118, right? Where, where are we gonna go? Escaping mount or sweeps? What do you guys wanna do? Okay, let's do it this way, democracy. Um, Raise your hand if you prefer escaping the mouth. I would say from our perspective, all our stuff has been covering mouth side control, so I would go mouth. Yeah, yeah it makes sense, right? Makes sense. Okay. All right, so let's escape the mouth. Um, again, now, the, so think about two, two main energies that are going to get you out of mouth. And it's the same two I mentioned before. It's, it's bridging and shrimping. And usually some kind of combination of those two things. So um, <clears throat> I have to read the position first though, right? So if, if we're in this position here, and uh, we get here, and we have to define things in terms of either he's a high and tight mount or he's a low and wide mount, right? There's, there's not gonna be a whole lot of in between. Now, this is where I would like point out the difference specifically. And because like he could get like real low, and I would not call this a low mount, right? It's low in terms of verticality, right? But 
Look at his knees. Look at the angle from shoulder to hip to knee. If that's an acute angle, it's a high mount. If it's an obtuse angle, here, right? So push your hips forward more and yeah. This is a low mount, right? Because now this is a like obtuse. Is that the right thing? Yeah, yeah. okay, yes. whatever. So when we're here, right? Now, most of the time people will, when they first establish mount, right? It's very rare, like if so get a high mount again, it's rare that somebody would get to mount with their hands never touching the ground. I can't even recall ever seeing that happen. I watch a lot of MMA and a lot of street fights. This doesn't happen. It has to happen that his hands are on the ground at least for a second before he sits up and starts punching me in the face. So I would like to try to take advantage of that. Now, here's the big thing. Just like Mike was talking about to reiterate a couple of his points or to paraphrase a couple of his points. Um, if, see how high his knees are here? The higher his knees are, that means he's, he's more off my center, right? That means that my bridge is gonna affect him less the higher he is. Like right here, he's still fairly over my center, so my bridge will affect him. Slide up higher, nothing, right? No bridge there, okay? So don't let this happen, right? If it does happen, fix it. Like don't, just don't get here. So, um, but if we're here, I wanna keep kind of T-Rex arms in. And granted, yeah, the, there's a prospect of him punching me in the face. So instinct tells me, close your eyes to protect them, turn your face away, and then put some kind of barrier. This is instinct. That sucks, right? Sometimes instincts lead us very wrong. So instead, elbows down here, right? And collect an arm. If his arm is this close to my shoulder or my head, I can collect it, okay? So I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna collect it quickly. I personally like to teach to take the extra second to switch. That's, not, that's a fraction of a second. If you can get good at this, it pays off really well. Because now, if I just do this, one, he could probably retract and slip it out. Two, if I start to go, he can maybe base a little bit still, right? So he could push through or pull out. So instead, when I collect, I pull this elbow toward his belly button and I drag. I wanna see his shoulder protrude past his elbow. That means his posture is breaking this direction, right? And I've got this double clamp here like this, right? I've got a Sasquatch grip, I'll explain. When we get here, I trap the foot on the same side. I look over to the direction I'm gonna take him and I start to bridge my hips up and over, mostly up more than over. Here, this way. And immediately, regardless if this is self-defense or sport, I like to go here. I stay low first, wrist to biceps, elbows down, fingers down and over this way, head low. Okay, does this make sense? What's a Sasquatch grip, Eli? Well, that's when you have a part human, part monkey and you mix them together, right? That's a Sasquatch. So this is a human grip, this is a monkey grip. I'm going this monkey, all five fingers over on the wrist, this human's back here on the elbow this way, okay? If you get to a position, and inevitably it's gonna happen, because uh, I've talked to people that have been training for years that have never really, that, that still get in positions and don't articulate this. This is typically for pushing or manipulating sometimes, ratcheting, this is for getting around things farther and scooping them in. If I try to get all the way around an arm, especially when your arm is as massive as mine, then this, this thumb gets in the way sometimes, right? If I move the thumb, I get over farther, yeah? Now, if I need to push it away, this is stronger because if I try to push away with that thumb missing, I'm gonna slip a lot of the time, right? So it takes, it, it's, it's worth being intentional in those grips a lot of the time. That's not to say you can get away with it sometimes, but again, the more detail oriented you are in your practice, the more likely the certain details are gonna start to materialize in live training, right? So it's worth being detail oriented. Don't train like you fight. I hear that sometimes like, train like you fight, right? And I'm sorry if anybody in here has ever said that. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily making fun of people that say that I get the intention um, because the intention behind it is don't do some dumb shit you would in training that would never materialize or you never even think of doing in fighting right um, hashtag Filipino martial arts but like when when we get to certain positions like I, train slower more methodically more thoughtful than you would live right you can't stop and think things through live energy Right? especially not in an actual competition or a fight because thinking takes time and time like creates a deficit right so to paraphrase solo burial which i think is a great quote it's like you know if you're if you're late you muscle if you muscle you tire if you tire you die right 
So that's the idea. Like right? I'm gonna have to compensate for for flawed technique and flawed timing with introduction of attributes, right? Now, the more I introduce those physical attributes, the more tired I get, and the longer I take, the more mistakes are made, right? And then the other person wins. So, in that sense, don't train like you fight. Train much more thoughtful, you know, than you're gonna fight. Because that then will start to carry over piece by piece. You know. You have technical precision and analytical things to apply as a grading rubric for your training before the fight and for your train or for your uh, evaluation of how you did after the fight right that's when you think you don't think in the fight you autopilot in the fight as much as possible right those are not absolute statements it's just like that's the shift in the lens that i think is a good one to have all right escaping out right so we get here all that from a damn sasquatch grip so i collect Nope, not gonna happen. We'll talk about that later. Now it'll happen. Collapse right here. The connection of my hands, collapsing that elbow, switching off, tuck, trap, look. And as I go, this is the one of those hidden jujitsu, invisible jujitsu things that people talk about. I look this direction and I retract my head backwards as I go. Right? Okay. Let's do this a couple times. Ready? One, two, three. It's like basically the, with a couple of little tweaks, it's like the first basic escape everybody learns. Um, it's like everything else that has problems with it, but there's no perfect technique. Uh, but techniques are enhanced through like combinations and recognizing energies. So I think recognizing energies is something that um, doesn't necessarily get talked about enough, um, at least not the way that I hear it a lot of the time in, in Jiu Jitsu, but I think that's one of the most important things. Because you'll see a lot of times when you're, when you're repping out a technique, um, it's stagnant, right? From the most simple of self-defense things to the most complex of sport things, it, like it's, it's often done in static situations. Uh, so your partners know more than like a, you know, a, a high level like a grappling dummy, you know? They're not like offering the right kind of energy. So understanding that energy is one of the most important things upon initial contact. And there's only three potential energies, right? So that's good news. Now those can manifest in thousands of ways, so that's bad news. But the good news, three potential energies. There's direct opposition, right? Energetic direct opposition. There is um, acquiescence, or there's like going with the energy, which is more of a technical response a lot of the time. And there's just stagnation. Stagnation, we can kind of throw out the window because if they just stagnate, don't do anything in response to what you're doing, just continue what you're doing and you win, right? But if they directly oppose or they go with it, we need to have some kind of response in the chamber. So every time I do a move, I need to at least have some kind of tacit understanding of there's probably gonna be two most common responses because of those two energies. And as long as I have those things preloaded and in, in, in the chamber, like ready to go, then I'm gonna be that many steps ahead in the process, right? So that sounds nice. Um, so let's think about how this applies to this kind of situation that we're looking at from the mount. And we're still talking a little bit more about a high mount uh, where we're doing a bridging escape. Right, um, cash couple <clears throat> So, and again, like, say he lands, and like, if, if he's within range here, like, this is gonna be collapsible on most normal humans, right? Um, because he's just supporting himself. He's not trying to make this an ironclad barrier, just like sticking it in the ground to not allow me to collapse it. That's not his intention, because that doesn't make sense, right? Um, it's a very specific response. But instead, like, if he got here, right? Now, why would he be this high? Well, partly because he's trying to, like, scoot up on me, right? Or maybe he started to sit up so that he could punch me in the face more effectively. And so go ahead and sit up and punch me in the face. And I pulled him back down, right? If I'm going to bump him back down like this because I don't like when he sits up and punches me in the face, then the way that I, I like to recommend it, like, this is my suggestion, my opinion on how to accomplish that. So he goes to sit up. Again, hopefully he's got clothes on. Right? It's still, you can figure it out if he was, uh, if he were naked, but let's not talk about that. Like we get here, I'm gonna grab some material here. I'm gonna bump with my leg and I'm gonna bridge off of the remaining leg. And that's typically gonna throw him forward. Now, what will happen though, is that his arm's a little too high for me to wanna risk overextending and reaching because look how, again, I don't like crossing my center line. Bad things happen. If he collapses his weight on top of me now, oh, this sucks, right? Now you have all that stuff that Mike told you to do, 
But I got on the bad guy's part, right? I don't want that to happen. So I'm not gonna reach across to here now, right? So the, the gauge I like to use is if I look out to the side and I can clearly see under his arm, his arm is too high for me to pull down, right? So if I'm not gonna pull, then I'm gonna push, because jujitsu. So when we go here, I'm gonna C-clamp just above the elbow toward the tricep on both sides, and I'm gonna shove out here. Almost like I'm doing a really sloppy punch parry, right? I'm shoving him off to the side. And I'm gonna keep going. I'm just gonna keep shoving him down and off of me. And he won't like it, and he'll try to turn back and square up against me. So as he turns back to square against me, he can't do it, he can't square up without taking this hand off the ground. It's impossible, right? So as he turns back to face me, go, 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 keep going. Yes, I'm gonna collect that arm that he picked up for me. And so um, him uh, trying to square back up against you, that's like a, that's an example of that direct opposition. Yeah, 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 good, you're listening. Yeah, so um, it, it is, it's like he's, he's counteracting, and that's a, one of the most common things, even at, even at a technical level sometimes, whatever I just took away from you is the first thing you try to get back, right? Now, from here, I pull him down, boom, like this. I shove myself off to the side. He tries to turn back and face me. Oh. And he gives me his arm. Now, instead of pinning it against me, which is fine, I can do that, I feel a little more comfortable typically grabbing with this kind of shopping cart grip and stuffing it in his lower abdomen here. Now, it's very awkward for him. And again, elbow or shoulder is protruding past the elbow, and that usually shows me the direction that I need to take him. Right? So that's a good little landmark to take inventory of. This is okay, it's worth taking the extra fraction of a second to switch back to here just like we did before because you don't wanna have a wrist like mine when you're my age and you get your wrist rolled like this a lot of the time. This is much more comfortable. I'm gonna trap the foot on the same side, I'm gonna look the direction that I'm gonna go, I'm gonna bridge, everything else is the same as we did before except now because like I've already got this one pinned, I'm gonna keep it pinned, right? So once I roll him over, now I get a little more vertical right away. Because I'm not as worried about him hitting me with that one. He may, he may glance, he may have some long arms, but it's not gonna knock me out, you know? And, come on, it's a fight. You're gonna get hit. And you deserve to, because you got in a fight, right? That's your tax you have to pay, right? The worse the position is, the harder you're gonna get hit, and you deserve it. So when we get here like this, now I sit up nice and tall, right? And if he wants to take a swipe at me here, be like, oh, that was a little close, boom, right? I can return it way back harder on him because I got gravity on my side and I can close the range that he's not allowed to because I'm pinning this down, right? Does this make sense? Yeah, one more time. <clears throat> so again, we get here and either he put his hands way up there or I pulled him down and made him put his hands up there like that and I'm pushing myself out to the side. As I do, this one is a little more arbitrary than this one, but I still like to push both arms initially and get out here and then keep shoving, right? to really show him that, because like, if, if he doesn't respond and react, I'm just gonna keep shoving my way out, right? But if he does and he'll turn back and face me, then I'm gonna tuck this back into his stomach here, right? Then I, I trap on that same side. This foot here that I'm trapping, right? So he can't post with it, just on the first technique and the second technique alike, it will always be there. And if it's not there, I didn't need it, okay? I call it the field of dreams principle. So when we get here like this, I bridge up, over, boom, this way. And you just go ahead and punch him for good measure, okay? Um, the Field of Dreams principle is, if you need it, it'll be there, and if it's not there, you don't need it. If there's something else better is there, right? You just gotta figure out what that is pretty quick, okay? Um, let's try this version, because this is one that you're gonna hit on people in practice that's gonna piss them off really bad, because they're like, that shouldn't work. Like, you're violating some pretty basic principles doing this. That it looks like you're violating, but you're not. It looks like you're violating principles, but you're gonna hit this on people that you shouldn't hit it on and it's gonna upset them. So it's gonna be a good good time for everybody. Let's go, one, two, three. Uh, so we roll out and um, I'm inside the guard. On both of these escapes, I wind up inside the guard essentially. Um, we'll talk, we'll, we'll go back probably and talk about like what happens if I do more of a shrimping escape instead. But when we're rolling up like this, right? And either I roll over like the first one and I'm here, or I roll over like the second version and I'm here, right? If he leaves his guard flopped open like this, then I'm having a good day, right? But let's, let's not count on it because, well, here's the thing. So I've been doing this stuff for like 30 years, I think. I'm, I'm, old, so I'm old, but we're all old. So like, uh, when, when I, and I, I started teaching way before I should have, but I started teaching like probably 20, 
five or more years ago. And if I was teaching something for self-defense, I probably wouldn't mention much about the guard from the defensive standpoint for self-defense. But things have changed. And now UFC, Bellator, War, like MMA is on somewhere all day, every day, right? And you have like armchair quarterbacks that don't even really train or train very little that just imitates it, right? So I mean, like the complexion of street fights has even changed to a degree just because of the proliferation of MMA, right? So um, I say that to say this, like I, I do address the idea of passing guard in a street fight kind of context or a no rules, let's say context, or at least limited rules context. So uh, that's what we're gonna talk about. So go ahead and close your, yeah. So we're here like this, right? And either I get here or here or whatever. When do I go vertical? Well, on the second roll up, we can get vertical pretty right away, right? Because I've already got this pinned in and I can get up here and he's gonna have a hard time reaching me. When we're, if we're starting low, I kinda have to make sure the time is right you know, to start getting vertical. Or I don't even have to get vertical to pass the guard, right? But passing the guard is, even against somebody who is like fairly unskilled, is not is still kinda fraught with some dangerous circumstances because I can be off balance from somebody who's awkward and spazzy and clumsy, right? He doesn't have to be technical to off balance me. He can just do some wild, crazy stuff. He can hit me, he can do different stuff to me from here. Um, so it's a bit like navigating a minefield to some degree, right? So I have to kind of watch myself when I'm doing it. So I wanna talk about two, maybe three guard passes, okay? Um, one, we're gonna start from here first, this way. This one, Straight Hoist Gracie, 100% Hoist Gracie, like I learned this from. Um, and you used to call it like the, the, no, the NHB guard pass. NHB was a term they used before MMA, uh, for old people. So you get here like this. And I'm using bicep ties, white crane kung fu, right? Do you ever do that kind of thing? Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. So it's, I've been there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, the reason I say that is because it's not this. This is like squirrel kung fu. I don't think that's a thing. But, <laughs> Taking my pinky outward this way is very strong. So that's how you're gonna play bicep ties standing wrestling too a lot of the time. So I'm going there close to the bend of his elbow like this. From here, I can take my hand away to hit, and that's fine. And hitting is a good way to soften the guy up a little bit, distract the guy, change the guy's priorities. Open spaces that need to be open, closed spaces that need to be closed. So striking has its place. I think that that's more important to use it that way rather than just straight Donkey Kong in the guy, right? That has its place too, but it's awkward, clumsy, and creates a lot of space. So, um, rather than taking my hands away and freeing his arm to be able to hit him, I'm gonna use my head, right? So you can headbutt. From here, as I go to headbutt, it's not here, right? It's not this, don't do that. Use this like kind of yarmulke style right here. Like, I know I just went from swastika to yarmulke and I, I apologize. <laughs> none of this is intentional and none of it is anti-Semitic. It's nothing like that. So I get here. Boom, headbutt. Be careful when you're practicing, right? But it's gonna, it's gonna change his priorities for a second. It's gonna distract him at least. So bang, here, this way. Now I switch to thumb posted grip on the insides of the biceps and I pop myself up to my feet this way. I like to land balls of the feet. I'm gonna switch off, post on the neck. Post on the chest a little bit to be nice to your partner, but straight roadhouse Patrick Swayze style if this is a street fight. We go here, I come up, crack the coconut a few times a few more times. As many times until he starts to open his guard because he wants, yeah, he starts collapsing in this way. Once the guard starts to open, PP dance. The PP dance is an underrated method of passing the guard, I'm convinced. I'm gonna do a whole instructional on PP dance one day, but for now, just trust me that get in here. So I'm tucking my knees in like I have to pee. This way, I'm trying to sit, almost sit on his butt. As I do that, I don't, don't reach behind you. Reaching behind you is the same as crossing your center line. It's still off balancing. Instead, hips forward until I start to see the bottom of his foot. And then I go out here like a quick draw artist, right? Well, I'm this way. I get it to center, don't cross center, switch. Pass, step, boom, off the ankle, straight to the face. Okay, so. Get here. Headbutt a couple times. Oh, just for good measure. Post, step, throw, crack, crack. I feel those legs start to open. Pinch, sit, push. The foot goes in front. 
keep it right here, switch it off. As I go to pass it and this hand comes off, it goes directly to his bicep, why? If I don't, I just push, he may roll out, he may twist, he may spin, whatever. This controls a lot of that movement contralaterally across his body, right? I bring that knee out and back. Good knee on belly position at the end, okay? Questions? Um, yes, so when you, uh, after you headbutt and post on his hands, do you kind of hop up on both feet all at once or do you like walk yourself up? You can do either. I like to hop because it's uh, a little quicker and it probably, um, is less enticing for him to make adjustments, right? So like hopping up quickly to my feet, it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's just, it kind of like accelerates the process a little bit. It's not that I have to be that fast or explosive, but I need to get things where they need to be when they need to be there. That's my definition of fast as it pertains to jujitsu. It's not athletically fast twitch muscle fiber per se, it's no wasted time, no wasted steps. Things go where they need to go, when they need to go there, right? That's what's, because that's gonna create an element of what's called like a tachypsychia, right? Like kind of like tachycardia, but it's like, when you hear people say something, like they get into a car wreck or something, and, or they get into some kind of tragic event, and they say, well, what happened? And sometimes you'll hear them say, I, I don't know, it just all happened so fast. Sometimes it did happen fast. Most likely, too many things, chaotic things happen at one time for them to process it all. So they process it as it was too fast, right? So I know I'm slow as shit. Like I'm not an athlete at all. So when I roll with somebody and they tell me I, I did something fast, I take that as a compliment because I know I wasn't fast. I know I just did things the right way. You know what I mean? So um, long-winded answer, but just a jump. Yeah. Okay. You all right. Uh, absolutely. Yep. So here, blocking in the biceps, splatter his nose a little bit. Oh, I'm here. Maybe that knocks him out. I just jump past. That'd be great. Hop up, post on his throat. Do I have to worry about the arm bar? No. Don't. Crack. <laughs> Crack here. The legs start to open. I step in, pinch the knees together so it draws his legs up. Sit until his foot pops in front. I don't reach back to grab the foot. I push, pass, switch off to the bicep. I retract this leg. I don't step this out. Right? This stays. This circles around. Okay, let's go, one, two, three. Close guard pass, and then maybe an open guard pass. Um, because, um, not, here's my thing. I don't believe in equal multiple options from a place. So sometimes you'll get somewhere, or you hear somebody teaching, I'll probably still say it even though I try not to. It's like, oh yeah, from here you can do this, or you can do this, or you can do this, or you can do this. It's like, no, you can't, right? Or you shouldn't, at least you shouldn't. From here, you should do this thing, because this is the best thing you can do. Always do the best thing. And there's only one best, because it's a superlative, right? Now, um, if something changes, that best thing may not be the best anymore. There may be a new best thing, right? Um, or you may not know what the best thing is. So you have to do the 15th best thing because that's all you know, right? And it can still work, right? But again, flawed technique equals introduction of attributes. So the analogy I like to use is a square peg round hole. If you try to jam a square peg into a round hole, it's probably not gonna work, right? Uh, now, if you take more of a hexagonal or octagonal piece, right? So it's almost round, but it still has sides, right? You can jam that shit in there, right? You just gotta try really hard and force it, right? And that's fine, but you're gonna work harder and you're gonna get tired. That's not a word, more tired. <laughs> you're gonna get that. Um, so, but you, you, you gotta do what you, what you, you gotta go with the arsenal that you have, right? So whatever that thing is that you know to do then, do that. Hopefully it's the best thing. And if it's not the best thing, after the fight, after the match, after the whatever, go back to the drawing board and being like, okay, I didn't know the best thing to do in this position or this situation, so we train more, right? That's why we train. We train to, for efficiency, right? We don't train to get bigger, stronger, faster. We train to get more efficient. We do that stuff to get bigger, stronger, faster, right? So that whenever we need it, we'll have it because we, we didn't have the right technique and we gotta jam it down their throat and force it to happen. So luckily, we lifted weights, right? We ran sprints, we did all that stuff I don't like to do, okay?
okay? So, um, what was my point? Oh, so guard passing. So this is a good one for if I'm down here, I'm on the biceps, I'm low, like horizontal posture, got the headbutt standing up, do all my Wing Chun stuff to pass this guard. Now, if, come on, you jump. If we get here and we did that second escape that we did a while ago, and so I'm vertical. Now, let's change this. Um, I am gonna be vertical, but I wanna talk about striking from here because I have a striking combo that I learned a long time ago from Matt Hughes, of all people, that I really like from here. Because what will happen a lot of times is when I'm inside his guard with a vertical posture, um, and he wants to stop me from hitting, this is just a band-aid, right? This is just a whack-a-mole band-aid, and I'm gonna get through that. So what you'll see a lot of the time, if he wants to control me better, he'll go, yeah, double wrist control. It's almost universal, right? So when we're in double wrist control, I don't wanna play tug of war, right? It's a Chinese finger trap, right? So you gotta push through. Um, that's, that relates back, let me, last tangent, and then I'll shut up and show you the technique. The fish hook principle I mentioned before, I think is a very important thing. Uh, if you get a fish hook stuck in your hand, everybody knows what to do, right? What do you do if you get a fish hook stuck in your hand? Scream? Yes, first, yeah. <laughs> Well, if it's just like before the barb of it, if it's, don't laugh, if it's just the tip, then you just pull it out. Now, if it's barb deep, right? You know what barb I'm talking about? Like the little like corner part? Yeah. If it's barb deep, you don't pull that out. You take a chunk with you, right? You gotta push that through to the other side. That's why I quit Cub Scouts, because I thought you had to do that, because I saw that in my manual. But anyway, you didn't have to do it, it just told you how to do it. So you had to push it through to the other side. So if you're stuck barb deep, you gotta push through, right? If it's shallow, you pull out, okay? I know, I there's no other way to say it, damn it. So um, anyway, so if we're here and I try to pull, well, we're just tug of warring, right? If he's stronger, he wins. So. I push pull same time. So I put my forearms on rails and again, straight blast, more, to, more Wing Chun. I'm telling you, Wing Chun works as long as it's in Jiu Jitsu. So when we go here, I drive, boom, straight forward this way, right? As I do, this one comes back, right? And then I roll boom, over with the elbow. That's gonna help break that grip. Now that grip is broken, I come back, free the second one, boom, or boom, right? So the combo is here, Back and forward, roll the elbow, trap, free, elbow, pin. Now we're back to where we started. I've got this pin still, now I'm ready to pass the guard, okay? And I've softened them up with those strikes, okay? So, because um, this one is, this one's, this first one is really difficult to see coming because it's kind of in a blind spot. And I'm riding up right in the, the muscle striations of this powerful human here, right? I'm going, boom, and rolling this back. The rollback stretches his grip and it strains his grip so that now he's distracted with this, right? If I go here, like that's, this is how I teach self-defense against like this wrist grab, just roll it over. But now I'm just turning it into a, boom, an elbow with it, right? Come back, boom, elbow, pin, vertical posture. Now we start to pass, okay? Practice just that striking combo because, well, because it's cool and then we'll put the pass with it, okay? Questions? All right, let's try it, one, two, three. I got a statement. You got a statement? Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Remind me never doing force on force shit. Repeat y'all up. <laughs> yeah. Um, but. I can learn all the bullshit out of it. Everything has its, has its place. Um, so, passing now, right? Passing from vertical posture with this hand pin. So, we get ourselves to this position, right? And I have one of these forearms, and I've got this kind of shopping cart grip here. That's what I call it. And uh, to get more vertical, when, whenever I talk about vertical posture, I, I like to use the term pretentious posture. Pretentious posture is where your head is turned up. If I do look at him, I'm looking down my nose at him. I'm not looking down like this, right? He's beneath me, so I'm pretentious, right? That's, that's the posture that we wanna take. Uh, because it, the more I start like, looking and admiring my work, my, my spine starts to crumble at the skull level, and then I start to like, yeah, it starts to topple. So, you know, it's, it's a good mnemonic device. So whenever we get here, I'm gonna step on whichever side I have the arm pinned on because it's harder for him to grab my leg when I step there. So I come up and I step very close to his body, not here, very close. The next thing is on this leg here, my knee stays where it's at, my ankle goes as far this way as I can make it, which is not very far with my hips and knees. So I pivot this way, you see. When I drop this heel, 
that makes the knee come up by necessity and this knee go down toward his stomach. This way. It's a lot of pressure on his hip and oftentimes it will get the legs to pop open right there, right? Unless he's super crazy flexible. So we get here like that. The legs have opened now. I'm gonna start to post this uh, inside here like this. Again, pushing, getting my shin to staple down this way, okay? Another striking opportunity from here, or elbow this way, okay? So I, I'm kind of bound up in this position. Not a great position if it's strictly grappling, but with strikes involved, that changes a lot in positions like this. The complexion, like there's certain positions that change like diametric opposition whenever strikes are involved or not involved or the rule set changes, right? Like half guard is a big one. Half guard bottom is great for the person on bottom in a strictly grappling situation, potentially. Um, when you add strikes in, now all of a sudden it's a horrible position for the person on bottom, generally speaking, there's exceptions. So anyway, <clears throat> I get here, I staple this down. Right from here, I'm gonna drop this elbow. Right, there's ways you can do that. We can be sneakier about it. I'm a big fan of what um, I've deemed uh, evangelist control. So, this is evangelist control. <laughs> here, right? Yeah, so everybody will respect it, everybody will show this attention, nobody will just ignore this. Right, and because I have this one panned, he may start to choose to do something with this other arm. So when he goes to push this off of his head somehow, I drop the elbow down behind it, right? So from here, whatever he does, the elbow drops, boom, and slides here, okay? So are you, um, are you trying to hit him with the elbow, or is that just like? If it hits, it hits. If not, it doesn't. Um, it's okay. Like, I, I, can, oh, I can just sit here and drop, but eventually, I want to drop it beside, behind his head, beside his head here, right? From there, like this, similar to what Mike was showing about gathering him up, from bottom, uh, this is exposed, so I wanna bunch this up and in. I'm trying to pull his ear to my knee, right? Now, I'm gonna play the air guitar on this side, try to slap myself on my own butt this way, okay? I scoop here, and then I'm gonna back step, right? Not cross step, this is a cross step, this is garbage. Back step, here, you see? Okay. So I've got this kind of little short, half cradle kind of thing. When I remove this leg here, like this, and it retracts, I think kind of like a Superman punch, right? This way. Uh, you guys know what the Superman punch is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody help me. I'll have to demonstrate that because my Superman punch is garbage. So when we hear like this, right? I get up this way. I did all my stuff, right? From here, I step, one, pivot, pivot again and try to pop that guard open here, right? Once I push this inside, shin comes down, striking for good measure here. I wanna to try to keep this wrist as long as I can. Oh, boom, elbows. I'm gonna drop the elbow here and pull in this way. All right, the, the, the main step in the process is getting this elbow behind him and pulling him in. If we throw an elbow in the meantime for distraction purposes, all the better, right? Oh, pull him in nice and tight air guitar inside his leg, right? I'm catching snuff box on the outside here this way, right? That keeps it kind of locked in. And I've got his calf kind of resting here on my bicep on the outside, right? It may slide up to the shoulder, it may not. I back step here this way. And as this last remaining foot shin comes off here, I retract and push away. So I'm somewhere between Side control, north-south-ish, right? Does this make sense? Okay. So we're using guard passing elements that are involved in this are gonna translate across the board no matter what the like rule set is. Um, elements will, not specific step-by-step -step processes necessarily, but we're using guard passing elements that are consistent, principally speaking, and just enhancing it since strikes are allowed and they're available. Okay, so that makes sense? Questions? Let's try it, one, two, three. Basically, it's the only amount of escape I do anymore. Um, because, and, and it, the, the hard part about this is like, I, I do that whole spiel about bridging and shrimping, and that's all you're gonna do, and that's how it's gonna get you out of the mouth, and yada, 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 and it's like, this one's kinda hard to diagram though, because like, 
it's got pieces, it's got elements of bridging and shrimping, but it's hard to diagram it. Like, I don't, I don't know, it's, a, it's kipping, it's a kipping escape. Like, how would you diagram this? Like, what the, like, it's not bridging per se, but well, it doesn't matter. So this is where um, I learned this by watching uh, Martin Kampman versus Jake Shields. And Jake Shields had arguably some of the best jiu-jitsu in MMA at the time. This was years back. My buddy Mike Pyle was teaching at Extreme Couture, and he was the head jiu-jitsu coach there. And he was prepping with Martin Kempman for that fight versus Jake Shields. And they knew that Jake liked to play this very specific kind of mount and would just mess people up for him. Because like, uh, here, I'm going to bring yourself on my top. What Jake would do is, rather than getting here and posturing or staying low and wide, he would get here and like drive these hips in. So he's got this like almost, not great binds, but he's got these crossed ankles and he's just boom, 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 like until, and then they would start just panic and roll over and give up their back a lot of the time. So this was the mount they specifically worked on for Martin Campman, who was on bottom here. And Jake got the mount maybe like a few times in that, that fight, but it's like, it didn't last for long at all because Martin Campman was just spot on and got out of it every single time with this exact escape. And I didn't understand the escape for a long time. Like literally years, I didn't understand this. And I, I, I talked to Mike about it and he showed me a lot of details. And um, then I just had to play with it more and kind of make it my own. And, and like, you know, finally, here's the thing. I'm not good at jujitsu. Like, so <laughs> it, it takes me a very long time to learn something. I'm pretty sure I have like an undiagnosed learning disability, but by the time I learn it, I have to learn it like really analytically and really deep into the details. So that makes me a, a decent teacher about it. Um, that's what happened with this, because it was uh, years, literal years, that I tried to figure this out. So I'm gonna try to save y'all some time. Um, when we get here, and again, low wide, meaning that from knee to hip to shoulder is like press forward heavy and down. And I'm drawing my T-Rex arms inside like this, and I'm finding this, I'm making this shelf with my hands on the hip crests right here. And I'm gonna put my legs together, and I wanna bring them up like I'm trying to touch my feet to the back of his head. And as I do that, then I imagine that I'm trying to take my pants off while I'm lying down. So when I come here, and then eventually, like, two shakes, and my knees eventually come free, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so, like, I'm thinking here, I raise, and as I bump my, my butt up, my hands slide down my legs, right? Usually one time's not good enough to get it, so I go again. Now my knees are inside. And usually by here, he either falls off to one side or the other or sits back on his knees and I come up to like a butterfly guard, right? So um, it's a powerful escape. It's really hard. Like the harder they try to hold on to the mount, honestly, the easier this escape becomes. So the, the answer, the counter measure to this escape is being not resistant to change, right? If you're supple and you're like, oh shit, I know the escape he's doing and then you do like Mike showed and dismount to like a neon belly or like some kind of other hip switch out to change the position, then you're gonna be a little more successful by countering it. But man, I tell you, like by the time they get here and they're locked in on your hips and the legs are together, it's pretty freaking hard to stop. Like I do this, I, I use this mount escape a lot. I don't worry a whole lot when people mount me um, for that reason. Um, gi changes things a little bit. Not a lot though, you can still use it in the gi. It's harder for sure. No gi. This is a, this is, this escape is money. So we can try this one uh, if you guys want to, um, because it is a really effective one. I just don't know 100% how to diagram it in terms of like bridging and shrimping elements. So fundamentally speaking, I feel like I'm just kind of telling you the steps to it and not the principles behind it. Right? Uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and do it. Yeah. One, two, three. And yeah. Right. So um, and John's not here, obviously. So like. I got that uh, thing <laughs> Yeah, yeah, hey, there you go. So, um, well, but more specifically, like, uh, I'm talking about, like, this for her is probably going to work on somebody maybe almost up to brook size, but even that's kind of capping it, right? Mm -hmm. But again, Field of Dreams principle, if you need it, it'll be there, and if it's not there, you don't need it, because there's something better, right? So, uh, can I borrow you, please? So what we want to do instead, because, like, this is just from an anatomical standpoint, the landmarks have all changed, right? She's just too small, okay? And that's fine because she has something better, right? So if you're here, 
this is gonna be better for her. If I'm low wide mount, right over here, and she tries that escape we just did, do the, the kipping escape that we just tried to do, just do it. Go ahead, do it, do it. Go ahead, do it. Nope, all right, so it's not gonna work. So when we get here, she's gonna turn to one side here. She's gonna stack. First thing is her forearm goes across my hip points and she stacks her two hands. Don't turn quite that much. Yeah, because you don't wanna give me that much of your back. But this forearm helps to prevent me from taking advantage of that space that she makes when she gets on her side a little bit. The legs inside my feet, very bent on this side, very straight and flat on this side. So for me to dish underneath is very difficult, right? That's too many berries. When we get here, there's two gaps of space um, over here. So let's turn this way a little bit. Actually, let's turn this way all the way. Two gaps of space. One is gonna be between my knee and her body. Two is gonna be by my ankle. Her knee goes by my ankle, her elbow goes inside this space. And she scrapes, scrape, 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 until that leg comes out. Then she traps that leg to save her progress. Mm -hmm. When you're riding, on, typing something on a computer, right? Like, hit save every once in a while. Because if the program crashes, you lose all your work, right? Hit save frequently, you know what I'm talking about. So now, um, she, as she turns to the other side, this arm's gonna come up and frame here, because I feel like she's slipping away from me and I'm gonna try to like ah, hug and smash. So this frame will help her out a lot here. The other frame is going by my knee or hip on this side and she's just gonna get her knee clear, just the knee. Yeah, exactly. Once the knee is clear, she squares up, right? Good, bring that knee up off the ground so it goes into my hip. Good, now we're gonna, because look at her where her frames are. Frame here, high and low. My arm is between her two frames. So the next thing that I want her to do is to hug my arm, mostly with your right arm though. So hug here. Pinch my wrist between your ear and shoulder. Yes, that sucks, yeah, okay. So then from here now, now you have to shrimp the other way, but this leg has to come up here. Shrimp your butt that way. Oh, yes, good. And get that leg out, nice, okay, excellent. That's gonna be way better for her with that giant size differential because I'm not gonna be able to seal the spaces. If I wanna go low and wide and smother, I can't seal all those spaces, right? Even if I wanna go high and tight a lot of the time, she's gonna be able to do a similar escape, even though for most of us that would be low and wide because again, the size differential, there's gotta be gaps of space. There's always gonna be some kind of escape route. That's not to say it's gonna be that easy and I'm just gonna like let that happen, but something I always get whenever I'm showing this elbow escape like this, a common response is, uh, that's a lot of steps. I get that a lot. I hate that comment. I hate when I show something, it's like, that's a, that's a lot of steps, or that's too many steps. It's like, well, train more, first of all, right? Um, but if there's multiple steps in a process and those are intentional steps, then the steps account for like the previous reaction to the previous step, right? Whatever this step is predicated on having happened beforehand, is why that step exists, right? If I just tell somebody, okay, you're underneath, wiggle until I'm in your guard, right? I'm not on top of you, wiggle until you put me in your guard. They'll do it like 35% right, right? The other 65% is to account for like the errors that are gonna occur and the reactions I'm gonna give, right? When she escapes that first leg, I'm not happy about that. I wanted her to be mounted, I wanted to stay on top. She got one of her legs out, so how am I gonna respond? Right? I'm gonna respond by trying to shrink wrap, okay? That's why she frames. That's why she turns to this other side to start releasing her leg. Why didn't she just pull her whole leg out on the second side, right? Because there's not gonna be space. I wanna make sure of that. So the frames help to guarantee that space is left that she can at least get the knee out. Now she's 75% free. So again, I'm trying to shrink wrap, trying to collapse spaces so she switches frames, dishes her hips to the side, and that's why she hugs that arm. I like the detail of hugging that arm. And then she separates her shoulder and her knee apart on that side to create this big gap of space to allow her hip to come out and eventually free that last leg. Now she's all the way back to the guard, right? So yeah, there are a few steps involved in this, but they have to be there. If they're not there, there's too much margin of error. So that's why like, I usually, the, the priority that I usually go through whenever I'm uh, showing mount escapes, collapsing, bridging like that, moving out to the side, bridging, so two bridging escapes, and then some kind of shrimping escape, and then the kipping escape because it's better than the rest of them usually, right? Um, but those are the ways typically that are gonna get you out of those. Now, um, <clears throat> running really short on time, so we gotta do another choose your own adventure. Headlock escapes, 
right? Or side control escapes. Side control. Side control. Okay. <laughs> That's usually always the answer. I think uh, I always prioritize headlocks a lot because headlocks are, I always call them the factory installed grappling move that everybody has, right? Because you're, everybody knows, like if you crash the space beyond where strikes are effective anymore, somebody's gonna grab somebody's head, right? Now, the good news is, because it was kind of a trick question, because most of my headlock escapes generally translate pretty consistently to my side control escapes in the beginning. But um, I will show like uh, how I prioritize uh, side control escapes. First thing, I want to front load replacing the guard, because replacing the guard is going to be your special teams, right? This is all I know about football. So it's either going to be your punt or your field goal, right? But I always want to try to run the play or pass the play. I always want to try to gain as much as I can. And then if I can't do that uphill escape, if I can't do some kind of true reversal and get myself to the top position from bottom, then I replace my guard secondarily, right? Or tertiarily. Yeah. So, uh, catch and All right. So, first things first, um, replacing guard from side control. He's side control some kind of way, right? So, here. And just generic side control like this where he's under my head he's under my far arm his knees are bunched up he may be sprawled out whatever so from this position here uh, if i want to replace my guard i'm going to create these two frames not the most optimal place for this hand to be but it's the most common place that it winds up whenever they establish this kind of side control one wrist bone slash forearm is in his hip one is in his neck if he wants to try to smash me tighter he's kind of choking himself a little bit so that's good so I'm gonna bring my feet in. I'm gonna bridge first, right? As I bridge, I bridge, angle my hips toward him this way. Now I shrimp my hips away from him. I've created a big pocket of separation between our hips. So I fill that with my knee and shoot back in this way, right? Once that knee is inside, I bite over the back with the other leg. And now this hand's gonna come off of his hip. I wanna scoop up around that tricep here, reinforce and I'm gonna separate my shoulder and my knee apart from each other this way. Right. So this is the last stage of what I just showed her. Right. Now, once I have my hip escaped here, I slide my foot out and I either re regain the guard or I get greedy and I go for the arm lock at the end. Here. Okay. But it's, not, it's, it's worth trying for the arm lock because even if you miss it, like, you know, you're still back in the guard because that's what you were kind of going for in the first place. The problem I have with this though is that for a long time, that's the only side control escape that you're showing. You're like, okay, your bottom side control, get back to the guard. Okay. Yeah, it's the simplest answer. It's one of the most direct answers. But it's like if you, I like to have things in order where I can like reverse the position and get myself to the top. And if, if they shut me down in my attempt, I still have the guard replacement. Does that make sense? Kind of, it will hopefully. So everybody can do this probably, right? Do this two perfect times and then let's come back and let's do like two side control escapes with this configured into it and try to use up the rest of the time on that. It's, it's worth having good side control escapes. All right, let's go one, two, three. Um, if he got to side control somehow, whether he passed my guard, he made a takedown, we lost, I lost a scramble, whatever is the case, when he's coming around, anytime that he gives me this separation, I'm filling it and replacing my guard, right? So what if he doesn't want to give me that separation? How's he going to stop that, right? It's still there. Yeah, get rid of that. Ah, yeah. He killed it. You see that? So he dropped his hip in, right? And it doesn't have to be that he hip switch. It can be. But he, it could just be him sprawling that hip to the floor, which I think is a more effective side control a lot of the time. But regardless, right? Um, so, like, just to show you what I mean, sprawl that leg back. Keep your, yes, this right here, right? So as, as he's come around, as he's beaten my guard, he's essentially past ankle line, knee line, hip line. This is really important. Back to white crane kung fu, right? So we're here, and I'm stapling his arm to his body. Why? Because if this is self-defense, he wants to punch me in the face, and this is the best arm to do it with. If this is, is or is not self-defense, he may want to reach underneath my head to secure the position. That's why my head is staying away. This is a little counterintuitive because instinctively what I want to do is this. Right? But now he can touch me and I don't like it. So I keep my head away. My kickstand is up, making my left knee, hip, and shoulder all up on my side like that. I'm, again, here, stapling this to his body, right? And the extension adds tension to it to keep it sticky to his body. This hand is framing against his neck, so if he wants chest-to-chest -chest connection, it's really difficult. 
If he doesn't like this, which nobody does, he can try to do something else with his hand, right? He can't go forward, so he can go backward. If he tries to go backward, I chase him, you see. So what's happening here? He tries to get under my head, it's not working. He tries to go back. Yeah. I'm gonna kind of Heisman it, right? So I'm gonna staple this elbow to the floor. And again, like, well, I'm not gonna go back through all that. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna C-clamp here in his elbow. I'm pushing his elbow 90 degrees behind his spine. I'm gonna post my elbow here this way. Yeah, exactly, right? Now, I push until he's in my lap, and then I take my lap. Does that make sense? So again, he got past some kind of how, like this, I'm up on my side. I go here, C-clamp, to push his elbow behind his back. I post up here, this way, right? Now, as he goes like onto my lap here, I'm just gonna take my lap out of the way. And I can go, depending on him, it will determine which way I take my lap out of the way. So I can either swivel my legs this way or that way. What I don't wanna do is try to come up here while he's on my lap, right? Instead of just push, 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 push this way. And then kind of skydive at the end, right? But the idea, elbow 90 degrees behind the spine. If he wants to shut me down in this process, right? So we go here, I start to push. Stop me, don't let me do it. 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 Yeah. Go on, don't let me do it. I'm gonna get my guard back some kind of way, right? Like the only thing he can do to stop me when I get that far into the process, so he's here like this, getting pushed, and he's starting to lose position, he's got to get a post underneath him. That creates separation between our hips, and then that gives me the ability to replace my guard, right? So that's why I'm saying that's the backup plan. The, the guard placement's the backup, it's not the primary anymore, okay? Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I like to sort of practice that one maybe, but I wanna show you kind of the overview of the whole like systematic approach that I've put together because I'm kind of proud of it, honestly. So like when we're here, um, we get here like this, right? So another thing he starts to do sometimes, he knows that if he retracts his arm, maybe that's not good because he's starting to open. So he tries to throw his arm to the other side, right? Basically the same thing happens, right? So if, um, and again, if like, it's too much separation occurs, just go back to the guard. As, as long as you have that in your mind, I can always go back to the guard. You're going to be doing okay. He throws that arm to the other side. I miss it. Damn it. Here. So I can't push it now. It's, I lost that battle. Immediately push myself out and come up to here. Right? Now we're in this kind of octopus side control. Right? So, same idea. Right? Um, and then... There's a couple other things, but like those are the primary. And it all happens from you not allowing his head to get under your head, or his arm to get under your head, right? Um, if his arm gets under your head, well, place the guard, okay? So it's, it, it kind of gives you a flow chart. It gives you got kind of a program, if then, if then, if then. And that's nice whenever that happens. And again, it's a, it's a good tool, again, in training or after the fact not necessarily to stop and think about the process in the live action, right? But that's kind of how we have to play the whole game. Any questions about this? Well, let's try at least that one, I would call it the Turkish get up because it looks like kind of like kettlebells from the Turkish get up thing, you know? Because uh, I'm pushing up and posting here like this and his elbow's going back behind him here this way. Once I get him to this position here, he starts to go into my lap withdraw the legs and then kind of skydive on top of them. Okay? Let's try it guys, one, two, three. The last part of, of um, which we're not even gonna go to, I just wanna mention it because it, again, it rounds out the system approach to a bottom side control that I like a lot, <laughs> is that um, we have answers for if I can stop that arm from getting underneath my head or touching my face, right? So we have those, we got uphill escape, one side, other side, we have that sit up, kind of turn over. If they stop any of those, we have the guard replacement like back loaded, right? Um, additionally, we, there's answers for if they do get underneath my head, uh, in addition to just replacing the guard, like the standard kind of way, right? There's still other options as well. And then finally, kind of the last stage, because 
you know, generally we want to think position before submission because it's more principally sound and a little safer and there's a little less risk to it. But um, there are some really good opportunities from bottom side control as far as submissions are concerned. So like that's kind of the final piece. And let's look at my favorite piece, but it probably shouldn't be. Um, just to kind of show you. So <clears throat> when he gets here this way, right? And he's kind of you know sealed in like this. So this this is kind of a sequence from where it's a little harder for me to get inside here because he's closing off the space. So I can't really get my frame in traditionally. But again, it's not there, so I don't need it. I got something else. I'm gonna take my bicep up against the side of his face. I'm gonna hold his hip and I wanna bridge into him and kind of crane his neck this way. Right? And he's being nice, but people are gonna resist here. And when they do, I'm gonna turn. Now, he's gonna get rolled. Unless he starts to pull this arm out, yeah, here, right? And so that's a common response. So then he goes to pull it back here, this way. What happened? Uh, he ran into my leg. That's what happened. Then I slide to the wrist here, and then we tie up this arm, right? Now when I come back, now we got a little arm lock here, right? <laughs> if he's like, nah, son, I'm like, yeah, and I'm like, nah. And so then here, from leapfrog to the triangle, right? Gather up this. Now we have this triangle. If I can't get this, it's not gonna be tight enough, right? So then we'll go up here to North America, or Kimura, from here this way, right? Okay. If he gets it to the other side, you still have this option as well, right? So you got some kind of cool submissions from bottom side control that are fairly low risk because it's like, what happens if they don't land? I'm still bottom side control. I didn't get in a worse side control from it for the most part. So even though it violates that adage of position before submission, it doesn't violate the spirit of it, right? I remember hearing that when I was younger, like there's a letter of the law and there's a spirit of the law, right? It was like a lecture I was getting for getting in trouble, but you know, it kind of stuck with me regardless. <laughs> yeah. So it's like you, when you understand the spirit of the law, you can kind of manipulate the rest a little bit. Right, and that's what's important. You, you, you don't, you're not truly able to effectively break the rules until you understand them well enough, right? Then you can later. And so, for some reason, like this is the second time I brought up Picasso today, but I guess it's on my mind. He, his statement was learn the rules as a professional so you can break them as an artist, right? That's that's the, the essence of it. So, again, techniques are techniques are techniques, right? But you can see people that don't use any of the same techniques as this person over here, these two people, and they're both world-class athletes, world-class fighters, two completely different styles. But I think if you really boil it down a lot of the time, they're operating principally in very similar ways, right? Because like, I, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's like almost like kind of a religious belief that like there's, there's something, there's some essence in there that principally at like a high enough level they're operating at a similar level, although they take different technical approaches to get to that place, you know? So, uh, but that's what's beautiful about martial arts, right? I was talking, we were talking about 10th Planet, and 10th Planet to me, like I didn't, before I really understood it, um, and Brandon McCaffrey, again, like I bring him up, he was one of the ones that like, I, I met him and he was like, you know, I've got black belts under me that don't play lockdown, that, that rarely use rubber guard. They don't play these, these things that are typically fundamental aspects of the 10th planet system, but they're still black belt level. And I still would consider them black belts in 10th planet because it's an, it's an idea, right? And just like jujitsu, jujitsu is an idea, right? At the highest level, it's a philosophy. At the highest level, again, it's Aikido, right? So, <laughs> all right, uh, that's all I have time for. It's not all I got, it's all I have time for. I appreciate you guys very much. Uh, training events like this are, they're, they're rare to come by especially getting together. And so Jeff, like for you to put this together, like this is like, I'm, I'm extremely grateful. <laughs> getting to work with these guys and patches and, and like, it's, it's, it's just like a dream come true. I still pinch myself every day that I get to do this for a living. I get to travel and share this stuff with everybody and uh, to collaborate with brilliant minds. And I still get to learn and be a student like that. Uh, I'm gonna get emotional, right? But uh, thank you guys all for being here. Let's get a picture and all that stuff. Let's go. Yeah,